Welcome to The Economy Magazine, I'm Benjamin Chong al Fares with the news from the global economy. On today's show, we take you to the Israeli Ministry of Economy's first ever foreign trade conference with a special focus on the future of Israel's flourishing gas industry. First, the headlines. Stock markets around the globe plunged as oil briefly fell below $50 a barrel on Monday and stayed there on Tuesday and on fresh worries about Europe's economy. Major stock indices fell as much as 3% in France and Germany and 2% in Britain, but gradually rebounded on Tuesday. U.S. stocks wilted with the Dow Jones Industrial Average sliding 1.9% on Monday, its largest drop since October 9th. In Asia, turmoil continued with the Nikkei stock average close down 3% on Tuesday. Fears that Greece could end up leaving the Eurozone after elections later this month hammered European markets. Greek stocks sank more than 5% on Monday, while the Paris, Madrid and Milan exchanges fell more than 3%. French President François Hollande called on Greece to abide by its European commitments and the European Commission, saying Eurozone membership was irrevocable. But according to German Chancellor Angela Merkel, a Greek exit from the Eurozone is inevitable if the radical leftist Syriza party wins and would indeed be manageable. U.S. officials monitoring the recent drop in oil prices said the fall in prices so far has been beneficial for the U.S. economy. U.S. average gasoline prices have fallen below $2 per gallon in much of the country, boosting U.S. car sales and other areas in recent months. U.S. stocks, however, fell sharply on Monday as energy shares sank following a 5.5% drop in the price of crude oil. The S&P closed off 1.8% in its first four-day losing streak since December 2013 and its biggest drop in three months. J.P. Morgan Chase, America's largest bank, became the first to agree to pay $100 million to settle a U.S. antitrust lawsuit in which investors accused 12 major banks of rigging prices. Investors accused the banks of having conspired since January 2003 in chat rooms, instant messages, and emails to manipulate the WM Reuters closing spot rates. The 12 banks held an 84% global market share in currency trading and were counterparties in 98% of U.S. spot volume. JP Morgan in November also paid $1 billion to solve probes into whether it rigged currency rates to boost profit at the expense of customers and investors. Israel's gas deal with Jordan is still on, despite recent turbulence between the country's antitrust regulator and the American-Israeli group that holds the gas resources. Senior managers at Dela Group and Noble Energy reassured Jordan that the deal for the export of gas was still alive. Jordan had called off the deal after the Israeli antitrust commissioner disallowed Dela Group and Noble Energy to retain the large Leviathan gas reserve. The supply of gas to Jordan was to begin upon completion of the development of the Leviathan field, but it's unclear how long development will be delayed. Fortunately, we've run into gas a few years ago. Uh, we were fortunate enough, by the way, to not have gas for the first 60 or so years because we had to look inward towards our internal uh, resources. But now that we have gas, uh, we're going to export part of it, we're going to use the other part for internal industry, and we're going to work through this. We need to ensure that Israel's future uh, is not held in a, in a too concentrated fashion on the one hand. On the other hand, we have to ensure that there's a flow of gas. So we're balancing those two issues, and we're going to get to the bottom of it very soon. Thank you. The Israeli Ministry of Economy held its first ever foreign trade conference in Tel Aviv on Tuesday, focusing on Israeli export trends and opportunities. Daniel Roth brings us the story. The first ever Israeli foreign trade conference took place in Tel Aviv on Tuesday, bringing together participants from around the world to talk economy and trade under the auspices of the Israeli Ministry of Economy. Though upcoming Israeli elections, ongoing conflict and corruption scandals have marked Israel's economic reality, Israeli Minister of Economy Naftali Bennett suggests that Israel is on an upward trajectory. Israel's economy is growing, is growing powerfully. 
uh, we've become the startup nation, uh, a nation of innovation that exports its innovation all around the world. Uh, we're exporting in, in fields of uh, life sciences, in cybersecurity, in uh, water technologies. As Israel faces growing economic pressure from the West, the country, it seems, is looking to develop Israel, new Israel, trade Israel, contacts Israel, in Asia as well as Africa. Africa is, uh, is the, next, um, the next tiger. Um, it is a huge continent with about 50 countries. Uh, some of them are more advanced, some of them are less advanced. And we definitely foresee that this will be one of the engines for our growing exports. And one of the themes of the day was the idea that Israel has to try to sell itself as more than just the startup nation, but the best at its game, as Israel's economic image and reality are ever-evolving. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Brad Stevens of the Wall Street Journal delivered the conference keynote address on the impact of local and global trends on the U.S. and Israeli economies. Here's what he had to tell i 24 News on the sidelines of the conference. I want to start with uh, arguably the biggest story in the world right now, which is uh, uh, the decline of oil prices. Uh, what do you think the root cause of this is, and what do you th think the effect is going into 2015? Well, Oil is a commodity denominated globally in dollars. And so, uh, there, I mean, there are a number of reasons. Obviously, increase of supply, particularly in the United States, thanks to uh, fracking, uh, the, um, the amount of Iraqi and Libyan oil coming online. Those are factors. But I think the basic cause is the sharp rise of the dollar. Uh, inevitably, if you're pricing something in a currency that's becoming dearer, uh, uh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get a, a steady drop in the price of oil. I mean, uh, the the speed of the decline I think also has to do with not just how much the dollar has risen, but also uh, longer term expectations. Of course, we see this affecting Russia uh, in big ways. Uh, uh, you had said in your sp in your speech that. Uh, uh, Putin is someone to look out for. That this, you know, that there's a difference between uh, democratic leaders and non-democratic leaders. Well, uh, um, democracies tend to respond to economic contraction or recession uh, by becoming much more risk averse. Uh, dictatorships often become much more risk prone uh, because dictators are not really responding to the economic needs of their people, uh, and sometimes they want a nationalist adventure, in fact, to distract their people from. Uh, diminishing e economic expectations. Think of Argentina uh, on the eve of the invasion of the Falklands. Think of uh, uh, Iraq on the eve of Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. So I just think that we need to curb our enthusiasm, our sense that we somehow have finally cornered Putin or, in the case of Iran, cornered Khamenei, because I don't think they're going to respond particularly peacefully to um, economic distress. They might become in fact, much more aggressive. Uh, you know, a, a confident tiger is a, is a scary tiger, but a wounded tiger is a really dangerous animal. So the, this kind of notion that sanctions are, are, uh, are a forceful uh, foreign policy and really having an effect is maybe an over, overstepping uh, of the analysis. Well, well, well the, I mean, sanctions in some ways are effective, but they're not necessarily effective in the way you think, right? Um, it, it turned out that the sanctions on Iran, at least before they were largely not lifted but eased uh, with a joint agreement, the sanctions really did hurt the Iranian economy. But hurting the Iranian economy is not the same thing as achieving a policy of denuclearizing Iran. And in fact, it might have the opposite consequence. Uh, so looking at America for a second, as a, as a leader in this policy, we're seeing in the US, in Japan, uh, in some other places, this policy of quantitative easing. Uh, what are we looking at here? What, what does this policy mean for the, for the next year or two? Uh, uh, are we going to see it continue? Is a bubble being created? Well, there. Two things. I mean, the U.S. is clearly tapering uh, the, the, the quantitative easing. We may be moving in 2015 back to a regime of normal interest rates at the same time that both in Frankfurt and Tokyo you have effectively a zero interest rate uh, policy. So the monetary spigots are being opened uh, in, in Europe and, and Japan at the same time that they're, they are uh, being somewhat contracted or, or tightened in, uh, in the U.S. So you'll see... If that intent, in fact, 
turns out to be the case, and I think it, it may well be, you may see a very sharp rise in the dollar against, uh, uh, um, against other currencies. And this is going to further exacerbate the, uh, the, the, the possibility of, um, of a crisis. There are $9 trillion floating out there in the world in loans you know, to various kinds of uh, companies and, uh, and various kinds of countries. Those companies and countries will find it more difficult to repay in ever more expensive dollars. Would you include in the risk package that Israel is facing uh, the potential of, of boycotts and divestment sanctions movements in uh, largely growing in the Western world right now? Honestly, no. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's morally uh, reprehensible, the boycott uh, and divestment and sanctions uh, movement. Um, we'll see how much further steam it gathers, and obviously it has to be, uh, has to be dealt with um, uh, you know, consistently. Um, I don't really see this getting off, uh, uh, off the ground. I mean, look, you, you don't know, and I think given the long trends of Jewish history, you always have to be um, very wary of this, kind of, uh, of this kind of activity. There's no question uh, France is becoming a scary place for, or Europe in general, becoming a scary place uh, for, uh, for Jews. Um, uh, we'll, we'll have to see, but um, that's not, that doesn't strike me as the most immediate, most obvious threat. It's a kind of a, a nuisance threat, and it's, I would say that the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement uh, ultimately reflect, uh, ultimately is going to hurt economies in Europe more than it does econo the economy in Israel. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thanks for being here. And Daniel Roth joins us now for a discussion of some of the main topics raised at the Foreign Trade Conference. Daniel. How's it going? Good. Thanks for joining us. So we saw these great uh, quotes from Naftali Bennett and from uh, Brett Stevens now. What are, what are your general impressions of what went on in this conference? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know if we mentioned it. It's the first one of its kind, the right, foreign trade conference. It. Yes, yeah. we did mention it a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting. Uh, the, the crowd of people seem there if, for the first time in a long time that I've seen were there really to learn from the speakers mm -hmm. uh, so that first of all in general it seemed like people were c kind of coming with questions in mind and not only this kind of uh, uh, need to network uh, which gave it a good vibe. Uh, one of the interesting points that was made by uh, Mr. Brett Stevens was that Israel, if it's going to survive, if it's going to thrive economically, right. needs to think of itself as uh, what he termed a boutique nation. Uh, uh, he explained that Israel is very good at a lot of things. It's a startup nation or the startup nation, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the best at uh, what it wants to be the best at. It's not Switzerland. Uh, in relation to watches and chocolates right. uh, and banking, it's not Singapore. It's Israel is an up and coming. Uh, but is that true? I mean, Israel has made a name for itself as a startup nation, as a high tech center. I mean, it, Silicon Wadi. I mean, it, it's right. you know, is that really true? I mean, one of the reasons I thought that we managed to get by um, during the the crisis, the, the the Great Recession, as they call it is because Israel is a boutique nation of sorts, no? Well, it's got the surface of that, and I think this isn't something that uh, Mr. Stevens spoke about, but I think it's kind of implicit in, in this idea of Israel as a startup nation, mm -hmm. is the reality that the st it, it's only a startup nation. Right. It doesn't have the big names. He, you know, he in his speech didn't even really mention Teva, but yeah. Teva is really the only big name company that is an Israeli staple uh, the way, say, Coca-Cola is to American. Well, there's Checkpoint um, also. It's, uh, there, there, are, there are some smaller but, examples, but, right. but so the, the point is that if Israel's really going to take a, the name of champion of startups, right. it's got to have some startups that translate to bigger deals. Okay, let's move on to the next subject, which is the gas industry in Israel, which is also a very big thing lately in the economy. Yeah. It's, this was a, a big deal, obviously. Yeah. Uh, right now, we've had these antitrust proceedings and uh, and the impending breakup of right. the Nobel uh, Nobel uh, Delic, Delic uh, right. partnership over Leviathan and a number of other mm -hmm. of, uh, other mm -hmm. gas fields. Uh, we spoke with uh, Minister Bennett, uh, Minister of Economy Bennett, who kind of dodged the question 
Uh, mm. By and large, he said, look, we're looking into it. Of course, Israel needs to profit from its natural resources. Right. And of course, people need to profit in order for the economy to work and all of these things. But he didn't really get into the issue. He didn't really answer the question of, so what's your opinion? What mm. should happen? Do you want to go with the with the Shishinsky uh, committee's kind of kind of focus on making public these resources mm -hmm. on uh, bringing these res the money raised taxing back. basically about 107 million dollars if i'm not mistaken right. on on these uh yeah or you know do do you agree with breaking up the monopoly mm -hmm. do you disagree he he kind of said eh, we'll have to see okay well i guess we will have to see very Absolutely. interesting things daniel roth thanks for joining us thank you that is our Economy Magazine for today, your daily source for economic and financial reports at I-24 News. I'm Benjamin chong Faris. Follow me on Twitter at chong Faris. Send us your comments and join us again tomorrow for more.